all, thanks for joining us. My name is Robert Benkov. I'm one of the automation specialists for Turtle and Hughes. Joining us again today, we have Casey Kluwecki, who is our co-host, message chat monitor, and Turtle and Hughes automation specialist as well. I also see some other specialists on the line, so thanks for attending. Today's pre presentation is on a family of products that I've been promoting, selling, and using for many years now. These products, I feel, offer some of the best value for its cost. What is this product, you ask? Well, it's the E1 Industrial VPN devices for remote access. Joining us today is our guest presenter, Rob Witcherman, Territory Business Manager for HMS E1, to provide us some more detailed presentation on the product line. Thanks, Rob, and go ahead. Please take control of the meeting. Thanks, Robert, and uh, good morning, everyone. So, yeah, let me take control here and present my screen. Okay, I think we're we're good now. All right, so again, good morning and, and thank you, Robert. Uh, my name is Robert Wichterman. I am the Territory Business Manager for HMS Networks. And today we're gonna be discussing a little bit about how we can help or how E1 specifically can help make your equipment IoT ready and really how we help our customers start down that path of digitalization. So get started a little bit here. Um, you know, a little bit about HMS. So HMS is a leading manufacturer of industrial communications and IoT solutions. We were founded in 1988 and headquartered in Sweden, but we have operations in 16 countries. We are publicly traded. We're just traded on the Stockholm Stock Exchange. And to date, we have something like uh, 700 employees worldwide and counting. We go to market with four main product brands. Uh, first and foremost is our Anybus line. So Anybus has a full line of um, protocol converters, communication gateways. I believe we have something like 300 different SKUs to pretty much you know, communicate with any field bus or ethernet network out there and have devices connect to each other. Um, and, and also Anybus has a full line of industrial wireless so industrial wireless access points, clients, and even full-blown routers. Intesis makes solutions for the energy and automotive, uh, automotive markets, uh, really has a strong focus on CAN bus type technologies. Intesis is gonna be, uh, they provide communication gateways for the building automation market. And then E1, which is gonna be our main topic for today's uh, presentation here is the leader for industrial remote connectivity and IoT data gateways. Between all four brands to date, we're, we have over 7 million installations worldwide. So E1 as a whole, um, what we are trying to accomplish is help our customers gain a competitive advantage, right? So we do this in two main ways, really. So first and foremost, you know, but by reducing operational costs through, you know, remote connectivity, remote access, uh, remote monitoring, you know, unnecessary service trips can be avoided. So really just making for a faster, more efficient support process. You know, if you can improve your fix on first site uh, ratio, then that, that is, you know, a lot for the customers. And that's a lot for uh, time and money savings of having to go back and forth to the site. And also, we're helping to optimize engineers' workload. You know, if an engineer is in a car, if an engineer is in a plane, in a hotel, he's not working as efficiently as he would be if he was, you know, back home uh, troubleshooting customers. So it helps to optimize their time as well. And then, you know, we can also help expand businesses, you know, especially using IoT type uh, functionalities. So, you know, with remote support, you know, uh, machine builders can send their machines anywhere. doesn't matter where they're located. They don't necessarily have to be within their travel territories. They could ship uh, devices or, I'm sorry, machines globally. Also, connected machines can send, you know, things like notifications, you know, um, will help you enable more proactive approach, say, to like spare parts or consumables businesses. And then, of course, you know, down the line, collecting data from these industrial equipment can also allow for new services, such as performance monitoring, predictive maintenance, both for the customer and for the machine builder themselves. So really, you know, th this is what we're trying to, to help our customers out with, you know, reducing costs and helping them expand their businesses or add new businesses to their line. 
So with any kind of new technology or new adoption, um, there are, of course, going to be challenges. And IoT has its fair share of them. Um, you know, this is kind of where you're, you're mixing OT, IT, cloud capabilities. It, it's a lot, right? So, you know, first and foremost, we're looking at any manufacturing facility out there has machines that's been on that line for 10, 15, 20 years. So you're going to run into legacy machines, maybe serial type communications or other, um, or proprietary protocols that are really hard to collect the data and get them into some sort of information system. Also, uh, security, always a concern, right? Anytime we're dealing with data, anytime we're dealing with a remote connectivity, you want to make sure that you know, the only authorized people have access to it and you know, nobody can you know, theft the data once it is being sent to some platform. It's, it's the super important piece there. Um, you know, unclear return on investment. An IoT platform or an IoT solution could take tens of thousands, if not more, um, and take weeks, months, years even to, to set up. So it can sometimes be hard to say, okay, well, you know, in a year from now, what are we going to end up with? How are we going to get the return back on all this time and money spent today? And then, you know, lack of resources. IoT is new. You know, it's it's still almost in some instances a buzzword yet. You know, people know that they got to move towards something, but not really sure of what that direction is. So, you know, the skills just usually aren't quite there yet. I mean, the type of person that have OT, IT, and cloud-based skills is pretty rare in the industry right now and, and only had by, you know, large corporations. And then, you know, concern for vendor lock-in. The last thing you want to do is spend, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, months or years developing something to either have that vendor go away or maybe you just decide, you know, this isn't the direction we need to go in anymore. We want to change that up. You don't want to be locked into a vendor. You, you want to have something that you can you easily switch to, to some other provider in the future. And these really are the obstacles that E1 was – you know, designed to help our customers overcome and really, you know, get them kickstarted on this digitalization journey in, in the easiest way. You know, we hear a lot about, you know, when you're reading in articles, you hear a lot about pilot purgatory, right? Kind of, you're constantly starting this IoT application or project, but you never really goes anywhere, right? These are the reasons usually why that, that seems to occur. So with the E1 line, we really have three value propositions that we can offer here. Okay, so of course, uh, E1's bread and butter is, is on-demand remote access. This still to this day is our number one, you know, a functionality that we're providing to our customers. We've been doing it for something like 15 years, and this is still the, the main reason people look to E1 uh, for you know, remote connectivity, for troubleshooting and maintenance of their devices. Okay, so, but then kind of going down a little bit, so the kind of the next step in this IoT journey is going to be what we consider on-premise data monitoring. Okay, so this is Giving access to data, you know, maybe through alarms or dashboards or, you know, KPI information, what it would have you, but not sending the data anywhere yet, right? We're, we're keeping it all local on the E1 or, you know, on the, the factory floor, and we're just providing ways to, you know, access that data in nice, uh, easy to visualize ways, right? So keeping it on site. And then the third and final where, it, you know, um, value proposition here is data collection for an, a bigger, broader IoT application. At this time, HMS does not have a IoT application that we offer, and, and really we specialize in kind of that middle, so that gateway type functionality, being able to read and send the data. But for our platform, we can pretty much get data anywhere. So ThingWorks, you know, Azure IoT, it, it doesn't really matter. You know, Amazon Web Services. We, we can send data through a multitude of ways, so it doesn't really matter. But ultimately, data collection for these IoT apps is for the you know, analysis and optimization of the machines out in the field. So the E1 line has two main products to it. So we have the, the E1 Cozy, which is going to be our VPN remote access box, right? So this is uh, device goes in the panel of the machine, allows for a VPN remote connection down to that machine. This will use for troubleshooting PLCs, viewing HMIs, and so forth. It's just remote access, though. There are no data capabilities here. So there, you know, other than remote connectivity, there is no IoT 
functionality here. Okay. Uh, the Cozy comes in three flavors. There's three different SKUs for it. There's an Ethernet version, there's an Ethernet plus Wi Fi connectivity, and there's an Ethernet plus 4G connectivity. So no matter you know, where the device is going, typically we have access to one of those internet uh, connections. And then kind of moving up, our flagship product is going to be the E1 Flexi. So the E1 Flexi has all the VPN remote access of the Cozy, so you don't ever lose anything moving up to the, the Flexi, uh, but it also has a complete line of IoT data functionality built into it. So this is where we can start collecting data and then providing services on top of that data um, uh, to really, you know, kickstart that IoT. And, and holding everything together here, the real solution of E1, the real solution of E1 that's, the, that's always been is talk to m So talk to m is our is our infrastructure. It's our global cloud infrastructure of servers. Um, it, it's, it's what provides all this secure remote connectivity. It's what provides all these services that we run on top of the, our hardware. So as far as hardware goes, um, you know, these are industrial devices. They are DIN rail mounted, 24 volt DC. They have a wide temperature range and everything has a three year warranty on it. Like mentioned before, the Cozy has three SKUs. You pick which, what kind of communication you want. The Flexi is a little bit different. Uh, Flexi is more of a modular type device. So you would buy the base unit and then add whatever connectiv or, um, you know, connectivity you need to it. So Upstream, you might be looking at you know, adding, um, you know, above and beyond Ethernet, you might be looking at adding a Wi-Fi or a 4G, but then downstream, we have a whole line of, of modules. So, you know, serial to connect to old legacy devices, USB ports for some of the newer PLCs, or even taking a, a simple I.O. in um, from, from a device. I always like to to show this this map here. I think it's a it's a really good representation of the scale and success of Talk to M. What we're looking at here is, I mean, of course, this is rough, but you know, each one of those blue dots is signifying an E1 out in the field. You can see that we're in pretty much all over the globe in 178 countries out there. Um, but what, what the real piece here is our infrastructure. So, you know, HMS is globally redundant cloud connectivity infrastructure, and you see all the light blue and black dots. That's where our server infrastructure resides. It's all sitting in tier one hosting facilities, and, um, you know, it's not sitting in our warehouses or, or, or our closet somewhere. And then, you know, throughout the world, we have over 40 servers actively running at this time. We even have infrastructure in hard to reach places like China and Russia to make sure that our customers can get connectivity no matter where their, their machines end up. At any given time, we have over 350,000 active registered E1s connected and ready for a connection and talk to them. Uh, that number fluctuates big time because some devices are set to go offline and only come online whenever a remote connection is needed. But to date, and I think this is pretty skewed now, but you know, we'll say 35, 40 million VPN connections have been made to date. I know during the pandemic, we were looking at 500,000 or better per month. So I'm sure that, that this number is growing uh, rapidly. And then uh, we are certified. So HMS has IEC 62443 certifications and also ISO 27001. We also work with a third party cybersecurity firm called Inviso. And what they do is they just help to make sure our solutions are adapting to the ever evolving security landscape. You know, help us um, you know, find issues or find holes and then help us plug those holes before anybody else finds them. And up in the right, something we're extremely proud of uh, since 2015. So for seven years in a row now, HMS has been voted number one remote access provider by control in the uh, control design readers by, in their readers choice awards. And what's cool about this, it's not a it's not multiple choice that they're picking E1. It, it's a write in ballot. So it kind of just goes to show you the the name recognition that E1 has in, in, in the market for remote connectivity. So now we're going to spend a few minutes uh, discussing remote access, you know, how that works, what that means uh, in the EWAN's world, and, and really how it can easily be applied to, to every, every machine. So this screen is, you know, probably a bit obvious, you know, but just to get through, this is an industrial application. This is, an, this is designed for industrial machinery. So 
the number one thing our customers are doing with with the remote access we're providing is troubleshooting PLCs remotely, right? So making the connection, pulling up their PLC programming software, connecting directly to the PLC and making pro jam, uh, programming changes or troubleshooting. Uh, then kind of second down the line is viewing and controlling remote HMIs. So a lot of HMIs have web servers that you can hit through a browser or uh, a VNC connection to using a VNC client to, to take control of that HMI. Accessing industrial PCs or any PC for that matter using like a remote desktop client. And then also connecting, you know, to IP cameras. Sometimes you just need to see what the issue is, right, in, in real time. So a lot of times our customers are putting IP cameras back there to get a live video feed of the issue. And th these aren't the only, uh, you know, solutions that they're being used for, but these are the four main ones. So how does how does an E1 remote access work? So so an E1 is a router. Um, it would sit in the panel of the machine. It has a LAN Ethernet network, which is where your devices you want to reach remotely will be plugged into, so the PLC, the HMI, and so forth. And then it has a, a WAN network, which is going to be our internet connectivity. Um, we can do Wi-Fi or 4G, but for this instance, we're just going to talk about a standard Ethernet connection through a factory floor. So using that factory internet connection, the E1 uses an encrypted outgoing connection over ports 443 and 1194 to go up and communicate to talk to M. Now that piece is important. So it's outgoing connections only, nothing inbound is, is permitted through uh, through this connection. So no, your firewall doesn't have to have any openings to come in, inside traffic. And really the E1 acts as a node on your network, living behind your firewall and living within those security policies. So once it connects up to talk to M, there's some encrypted handshaking going on that's connecting it directly to the specific account that it was deployed to. So then when a user wants to access it, he simply fires up one of our client softwares, log into the account, selects and connects uh, to the E1 that they want to connect to. And at that point, we create a VPN tunnel from the user all the way down to that factory floor. And now it's a true VPN, so anything can be can be uh, pushed either uh, you know, bi-directional through the VPN tunnel. What we're kind of showing here with the green checkbox and the red box is we have 100% land segregation. So nothing on the factory floor can access anything behind the E1 and nothing behind the E1, including the remote user has any, has any access to the factory floor. We do allow for one-to-one -one natting. So if there is a SCADA system that needs to you know, communicate with the PLC, you can add that to the one-to-one -one NAT table and allow for just that communication. And of course, this is all administered by the, the talk to m account administrator. So you can manage all this connectivity in multiple different ways from user access to, to device access. And, you know, uh, one of the challenges of remote connectivity is getting acceptance from the IT team of where the machine will be going to, right? And and really, it's 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 more of a of an education process just to just to educate the end user of of how we're doing our connectivity. And once you go through the screen that I just went through, you can that kind of usually opens that up to you know getting your it approved by IT. And really, these are the five things we we you know when we're having those conversations that we're hitting on, we're not getting into the deep details of, uh, you know, SSL, TLS, encryption, and all that stuff. Um, so, you know, firewall friendly, outbound connections only, no inbound connections required, uh, land segregation. So we are acting as a firewall between that factory floor and the remote user. The customer at the end can keep full control of remote connectivity. It can be done in multiple, uh, you know, multiple different ways. So there's an imp a digital input on every device. A key switch, you know, physical key switch can be added to it. An HMI button press can be added to it to enable and disable that remote connectivity. And plus, within talk to end and with within the account side, you can enable disable users or enable disable E ones as well. So kind of two ways of of going about keeping control. And then, of course, we keep every connection in an audit trail. So if somebody connects in at night, um, something happens, you have the, the administrator will have full audit control of that. So you'll be able to see what user connected to which device at what time, um, how long and how much data that went through the, the tunnel. Um, 
And then, of course, two-factor authentication is something that we highly recommend that all accounts use. Um, so that is a piece for the login. Um, so they'd have to use account name, username, password, and then two-factor authentication. You know, two-factor authentication is good enough for a banking server, so it's also the same level of security we offer our customers. And all of this is how we uh, get that IT approval. So to make these remote connections, we have three clients that we can use. Okay, so uh, first and foremost is going to be our standard eCatcher connection. So this is our desktop client, Windows-based software. This would be what is required to troubleshoot a program, uh, a PLC program. Um, this creates a true VPN down to the box so that once that VPN is in place, you fire up the software and away you go. This is also would be used if you're managing your talk to m account. So the eCatcher would get in and that's where you can manage users, devices, um, user rights and all that. M2 Web is not a true VPN client. It's, it's more of a browser based proxy to devices behind to, to the E1 services or devices behind the E1. So really we were providing three services with, with an M2 Web. Um, you can connect to devices web servers, so uh, the web server on the, the E1 or a web server on a device behind it, as long as it's an HTML web page. Um, there is a VNC client built into the M2 web service, so if you want to connect to, say, a panel view uh, over a VNC connection, you just need a device with a browser to log into and make the connection. No other third-party VNC software would be required. And then we also have a remote desktop client, so you can connect to an industrial PC or laptop that's that's living on the E1's LAN. Um, and then third, uh, finally here, it's the, the eCatcher mobile. So this is going to be our, our mobile app solutions that's the downloadable from the iOS or Google Play Store. So this does create a true VPN from the phone or from the tablet down to the machine. But of course, you know, PLC programming software isn't in an app, so you couldn't really use it for that. It's more for there's some proprietary like HMI mobile apps out there that you could connect to the HMI if you were on the same Wi-Fi network. This would put you on that same Wi-Fi network, essentially, right, on the same network as the HMI remotely, so you can run those apps um, remotely. And of course, there's some data monitoring functionality that the Catcher Mobile also can provide. Here's just a, a quick uh, customer use case, Thiele Technologies. They, um, they produce packaging machinery and they ship this machinery throughout the globe. They've been a long time user of E1 products. I think eight to 10 years now, they've been putting an E1 on every machine. And here's some of the benefits that they claim that you know, using the remote connectivity gives them. So first and foremost, they're able to resolve issues a lot faster. Before it used to be, you know, an estimate of two days, now they can do it with two and a half hours or, or, or so. So as you can imagine, it makes the customer very happy. We, we get, uh, you know, increased uptime, you know, get an extra one and a half days of running out of the machine. That's, that's huge cost savings on the customer end. And then of course, of course, you know, their own cost savings. So they estimate they do about 150 trips a year, $5,000 per trip with all the travel and, and everything included. So somewhere in a range of $750,000 a year is saved using E1 connectivity. So uh, again, one of our, one of our long term uh, customers, they feel that remote access is all they need and it gives them these benefits, which is, which is huge. So that kind of wraps up that piece, the remote access piece. Now we'll go on to on-premise data monitoring. And really what we're going to start talking about here is leveraging the data of the machine in a pretty simple and efficient way to have you create some sort of you know, starter IoT platform. So what does on-premise data monitoring mean? Very simply, we're, we're starting to read data from the PLCs give services on top of that data, whether it be alarming, logging, uh, visualization, what have you, and then giving you access to that remotely, right? So big point here is all the data stays on premise. We're not you know, using developers and, and sending it off site anywhere. It's all staying within the E1 or devices behind the E1. We're just giving you remote connectivity into it. 
So this is where from here on out, we're going to be concentrating on the Flexi and all of its data services. So the Flexi is kind of an all-in-one solution. Um, it has more functionality than we're showing here, but these are the main pieces that we're going to be going over today in the following slides. So as you can see, it's kind of an all-in-one remote access IoT data gateway. It can pretty much bring everything together and get that IoT started, right? So let's kind of start things off here. Um, so the data acquisition and logging. So what that means to an EWAN is we have all the PLC protocols built into it, and we call that our IO servers. So the first thing you need to do when collecting data from a PLC is, is configure the IO server. And if it's an Ethernet-based um, PLC, it, it's very easy. Uh, for instance, you know, the Rockwell, Allen Bradley is uh, AB Logix is what we call the IO server. And to connect to the PLC, you simply put the IP address of it. And, and that's 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 as far the extent of the configuration of the IO server. And then once you have that established, now you want to start pulling data from it. So you would create a tag on the E1, address the tag back to the E1 on, on back to the PLC, and then put a pull rate to it. And now we start storing that information and timestamp values on the Flexi's hard drive. Now the Flexi is can log data, but it's not a data logger per se. So it's not a historian or a SCADA system. So it only has a limited buffer of memory. And we say about a million data points, depending on how the memory is allocated, it can store. And then it's first in, first out. So it starts overwriting itself. So by that time, you want to do some sort of other functionality with it, uh, whether it's dumping it into some database or, or visualizing it. And we can create multiple tags. You can use multiple IO servers on each. I think we say we can do somewhere in the realm of, you know, 500 to 1500 tags pulling data simultaneously, just depending on how fast you have the, the pull rate too. And a nice thing about this, you know, this is the first step to, to collecting, um, but you don't need to stop the PLC or write any additional code, right? So you start with the Flexi connected for remote connectivity, and then down the line, you're like, oh, you know what? It would be nice to get some information from this tag. And then you can add that without worrying about having to reset the, the PLC or stop the PLC. Once we acquire that data and we're starting to store it locally, now we can provide things like, you know, email or SMS notifications. So, you know, Every tag has the option of adding a, an alarm to it, and we have up to four thresholds you could set per tag. So low, 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 high, high, high. And once those thresholds are met or exceeded, the E1 system can send out an alarm via email or SMS. Talk to M services has these relay services, so you don't have to add them. You don't need to have an SMTP server locally. It is all provided for through a free Talk to M account. There would be some charges on the SMS side of things because it has to go through some provider, you know, AT&T, uh, Verizon, what have you, um, but email is completely free. And all providers have the text uh, or email or text relay services. So, uh, for instance, I have Verizon, so it's my phone number at vtext.com. You send an email to that, it transposes it into a text and sends it, which would be a free uh, option for alarming. Moving forward a little bit, now, now we're starting to get into the actual monitoring of data, so the monitoring of maybe machine health or uh, and or performance. Um, and this is a newer feature, so it's uh, we call it KPIs, Key Performance Indicators. And what this is, is every Flexi can have up to six tags on it be configured as a KPI to show its current and live value. So it really enables a nice view of your machinery if you're using M2Web or, or eCatcher Mobile, where you can log in and instantly see some live values of your whole fleet of E1s. Um, and, and the beauty of it all is, you know, to do this configuration after you have your IO server configured and your tags configured, it's a checkbox. You know, send this data as a KPI, and you can choose six of those tags to be KPIs, and you you have a relatively straightforward, you know, uh, information-rich dashboard of some sort of all your machines. And something else that we can show other than live values is going to be the alarm state of those values if you have alarms configured. So your blue is going to be normal. Your orange will be a warning state. And then, of course, red means that you're in an alarm state. So you know, easily log in using your M2Web connection. Oh, I have an alarm. Go in through an e-catcher and, and see what it is and you know, fix and acknowledge it. Uh, both 
M2Web and eCatcher Mobile have you know, either a list view where you see the data kind of as on the screen here, or a map view so you can kind of tell where your E1s are if you're more of a global outfit. And then past that, you know, the KPIs are very nice, but they're, they are a little bit limited. We're only allowing for six. It's just a quick snapshot of, you know, key indicators. But you can go into full detail and create dashboards that show, you know, a lot more detail. Every E1 has a web server, or I'm sorry, every Flexi, I should say, has a web server. Um, so you can add HTML pages or you can put, um, you can use one of our free softwares called View1, which is nothing more than a drag and drop, you know, web HMI editor, dashboard editor, if, if you will, which allows you to, you know, put animations or objects onto a screen. So gauges, text, text boxes, buttons, whatever, and then tie that back to the actual tag view. So, th so then you can create kind of like a nice, you know, dashboard of such. And of course, these would be reachable through um, all the clients on the E1 side as well. And, and really, um, us at HMS, we really believe that just this piece of it is a great first IoT project. Everything I've shown you here today is super simple to set up, whether it's remote connectivity, uh, collecting data, alarming, you know, live KPIs. The dashboard editor is a little bit more involved. It takes a little bit more, you know, of creating on that side of things. But at the end of the day, you get an extremely fast to market IoT project. Um, you know, very easy to do. It's mostly wizard driven or check boxes that you're checking. I actually have a, a we have a web page out there that outlines every single step of the way uh, using a Rockwell PLC. So you can go right down the right down the line and create, um, you know, all these things within hours, maybe day or two. Um, and then extremely cost effective. Uh, uh, the price of a Flexi is under a thousand dollars. All this functionality is from a, you know, you can be used on a free talk to M account. So really you can have all this for a thousand dollars per machine and, and, and really kick off that IOT project of yours. So now what we're going to do here, I'm going to switch up a little bit and I'm going to go through just a quick demo so you can see what this could look like in, in real life here. Okay, so what I'm going to show here is this is our, our just our E1 live demo platform. So we're going to go through kind of what it could look like for a customer of a machine builder to log in and, and view some some data. Okay, so for for this instance, we're going to pick packaging machine. And what we're showing here, this is just an example web page of an example company called CB Machinery, right? So somewhere on their web page, you know, you can see that there's all their their product information. Contact us, sign up for our newsletter. But somewhere on that page, it has you know a remote monitor, a remote system monitoring login, or whatever they want to call it. They want to you know call it something fancy for monitoring reasons. So we're going to put in as the as an end customer, we're going to put in our our login information that was provided by the machine builder. It's going to automatically log us into the M2 web interface here. Now, this interface is completely customizable as well. So if you want to put, you know, their own logos or your own color schemes and all that, you can use our M2 web logo program to make it look and feel just like your company, um, you know, marketing is concerned. And then, you know, down in the corner, you'll just see that it's an HMS E1 product, right? That's the back end of this whole thing. But what we're looking at rather simply here is same thing you would see in like an eCatcher connection. We use the same credentials to log in as we would on an eCatcher connection. Each one of these blue lines is an E1 out in the field somewhere. You can see these ones are scattered kind of throughout uh, Europe. Um, but, you know, all these description, land devices, city, country, this is all customizable. So you can make it you know, be whatever you want to identify your devices. But as you can see, we just logged into it and four of these E1s here are producing KPI information. So you can imagine if you have your entire fleet here, uh, the machines that you own or within your facility, um, you can log in and bam, right, right here is your OE information, your production information, what's going on, your energy consumption, whatever you may be. Um, and then also you can see, hey, there, there's an alarm going on here. Let, let's, it might be uh, time to dig into that a little bit more. But so we're going to dig a little deeper here just to kind of show you some of the other features. Um, so this one is a has a AB Compact Logics behind it, and we have some services that are built into this one. So as you see, you can put 
different links here to different services behind the E1. So for instance, this one has an IP camera. So we can easily get to the web server or the IP camera to show the feed of this of this system that is in Barcelona, right? So you can see nice live feed, what's going on currently in the system, uh, gives a good eyes on, on, on the machine. And then secondly, we have an HMI here. So the HMI allows us to use the VNC client that is built into M2Web. So you see, I didn't fire up any other software or anything like that. And I'm just gonna connect to the VNC server of the panel view HMI that is living behind this E1. So with VNC, if it is enabled on the device, you can even drive it, right? So we can drive the, to the next page and, and drive our different uh, scenarios up and down, whatever you need to do. So if you were there on site looking directly at this HMI, you would see me you know, flipping through it here through a VNC connection. And sometimes that's enough. You know, that's the HMI has all the visualization, has all the data that you need to see. So just getting access to that might be enough. And then the third thing here is we have a view on page that's loaded on this E1. Go in a little bit more detail here, just a, a different web view of it. Uh, but you can see you know, these are kind of like the objects that we can drag onto the screen. This is, of course, custom. So you can do custom or you can do built in. Um, animations that are that are in view on, but you know easily see some OE information, some production information, and one nice thing is we're not just reading data from the PLCs. We we actually built a driver to to communicate with them. So yes, we can definitely pull data, but you can actually set data points back to the PLC if you wanted to. So then that will allow you to put start stop buttons or text boxes where you can input information. And some other kind of simple things that you can do, you know, just a historical data log um, of certain points on a on a bar graph or on a line graph. Um, you know, bar graphs, a production value for your days of the week. And then you can even embed a complete alarming system in here where you can go see which alarms you have and then acknowledge the alarms directly from this web page. So so as I, as you can see, you know, all this very simple configuration, a nice you know, way to access into it. But a lot of times, you know, for, especially for customers who are not really sure what that end goal for the IoT platform is, this is a, a great way to start, a great way to start visualize, visualizing data and a great way to start learning, okay, these are the data points that I need, these are the data points that I want to see, um, or this is the service that I need to provide with it, right? So it, it gives a great start. So let's go back here and we will finish out the presentation. And another customer use case, um, Waztec Engineering out of California, they, wake, they make skid-mounted wastewater management systems that neutralize the pH levels of the water before putting it back into the public sewer. And again, uh, been an E1 customer for eight to 10 years, actually started putting the E1 on every machine just for remote connectivity. And then, you know, now within the last few years, they have really grown to expand their business offerings and, and give them the, even more of a competitive edge using our KPI system and uh, local dashboards. They're not using our view on, they use, they have an HMI, so they're, they're providing access to that HMI for it, but still, you know, still able to monitor information behind the E1. And at this level, we're not through sending that data anywhere else. And as you can see, they, they have a, a really nice web page all designed out for it. They call this communication skid link to, to log into their systems. So the, either their, their customers or their internal teams can log into skid link and monitor these machines remotely. So really nice use case showing how, you know, like the typical E1 user starts with remote access and adds functionality from there on out. And the final thought here on on-premise data monitoring is, so yes, we can collect, right? But, and, um, and give visualization to the information, but we can also act as a communication gateway and publish information, okay? So what that would look like is, um, we have OPC UA server capabilities and client actually built into it. So we can be collecting information from multiple different types of machinery and everything, you know, through different protocols, legacy, serial stuff. 
and then publish all that information via an OPC to a SCADA system or a historian, um, you know, back down to the factory floor. Now, we there are actually a lot of customers who don't use remote access or any of the visualization functionality. They only use it as this OPC UA server just to, just to uh, centralize all of their data. As long with with OPC, we can also publish Modbus TCP. So if the SCADA system only speaks Modbus or the historian is only Modbus, we can publish that data back as Modbus as well. So there we go. We, we wrapped up on-premise data monitoring. So now we're going to talk a little bit here and just touch on it a bit about the data collection for IoT applications. And, and I really think that this is what people first think whenever you see, say, an IoT project. This is what they're dreaming of, right? Their you know, information living in Azure or in ThingWorks. They log in from anywhere, from any device, and they have access to all their machineries through a singular dashboard or through the logs or, or, or what have you. So this is where you know that third and final value proposition that the E1 offers is we can get data from anything and then we can get it to any platform that's out there. So we do that in two different ways, really. Um, we can either directly push from the Flexi to that platform. So typically we're going to use, you know, common protocols like MQTT or HTTPS to, to push that data directly into it. Or we can use one of our talk to m APIs. So sending the data to talk to m there would be a temporary storage there. And then the code from one of these platforms would go in and retrieve it. Um, you know, all these platforms could use either way. Um, you know, a developer that knows APIs or how to send data can easily Put these into place but we do have two options for it and they are wide open options for, for anybody to use kind of the use case quickly here um, so with mqtt or https we're typically talking about streaming of live data okay so whenever you need data pushed uh, so usually a lot of data pushed and very quickly you're going to have to do it in a direct manner so um, you know one thing about pushing a lot of data is that if you're using a service like a talk to m api there are limitations to how much you know um, a lot of the larger projects here could be sending hundreds of tags every second or, or even more than that i've seen so it can get you know pretty pretty intrusive pretty fast if you're if you're sending it to an intermediary server in between it but usually with this kind of direct connection you, there's there's some acceptability of loss of data since it's kind of a live monitoring type platform. Now, of course, that data loss can be mitigated through through code on either end of the device, but typically we're just sending it as fast as we can, and, and we're not really worrying if it gets to where it's going to go. So there's no checks and balances built in. Um, MQTT and HTTPS is available on pretty much every platform out there. It is the standards on, on, on sending information. So it's not like, oh, will it work with this? You know, it likely it will in, in some fashion. But it it does require semi-significant development on both the IoT application end and the E1 gateway end. So the E1 would need some Java code to, to, to you know, use these protocols and then the application would need some development to receive the data as it comes. So where we see this coming into play is so the customers that, that we, we see using this type are going to be your larger OEMs or, or uh, end users. The ones that have those resources in place, um, you know, the, the ones that know IoT, that know MQTT, and they can really develop their own communication connectors between the two places and, and also software houses. So we have a lot of uh, partners or, or just software houses who make some sort of application, but they they need help retrieving and sending the data to them. So they, they use our tools for development to, or they use E1 for getting their, getting the data to their tools. And so the use case for talk to M and this is really the more you know, prevalent one that we see to date here. It's a lot easier to set up. It's going to be using our data mailbox API, which is really just a temporary storage on talk to m it holds it for 10 days and then it, it, it deletes it. So before that 10 days is up, 
the system will need to go in and retrieve it and bring it into it. So it's really more for historical data, you know, doing analytics, reporting, just dumping it into a database maybe. Um, uh, but but it's a lot easier of a configuration. So the the data that is sent to talk to M is also kind of buffered, right? So there's data synchronization mechanisms going on there. So if you had a power outage or internet connection goes down, um, the talk to M would know that the E1 it didn't get that data and retrieve it from the E1, or it would know that it's duplicate and get rid of the duplicate, so you don't have any dirty data in there. And that's all built into the mechanisms of the API, so that wouldn't have to be developed uh, on your own. And by doing that, you know, if you want to send data to talk to M, the data mailbox, again, you're looking at a checkbox. I want to do historical dating data, and I want to send it to data mailbox. All right, checkbox, checkbox. So what the customers we see is, is our standard small to medium-sized business um, machine builders and end users. Some that have some, you know, resources on, on, on site, but not the full development that would take to do others. And the nice thing about it is we have a complete solution partner list of apps that have already done the development for the data mailbox ABI, API. So on their end, the connecting to the API is just putting in your your talk to M account credentials and away you go. You can pull data into their platform. Last screen I'm gonna go over here. Um, it's a busy one. I'm not gonna go through in depth on every single layer here, but just know that you know, besides the, the things that we talked about earlier in the presentation, there is a whole slew of uh, you know, layered security approach, um, you know, all the way from the E1 device itself up through all the different uh, you know, end user, uh, connection traceabilities, corporate firewall roles, living behind the proxy or the security policies of the end user. There's a whole host of security going on. And this is what the ISO 27001 certification kind of monitors, making sure we are staying up to date on these business practices so that the, the system stays secure. And we can always talk about each one of these individually, but I, I think uh, just kind of showing you the all that's available it's probably enough for this presentation today. And after that, I think that, yep, that is all that I have today. So at this point, I'm not sure if there was any questions that came in, Robert, or if we want to open up to verbal and or chat questions, we can do so now. All right. Nobody, Nobody had any questions in the chat. chat. So if anybody, so if anybody wants, wants to uh, unmute their mics, if you have any questions for Rob. Guess I did a good job. Yeah, very good Excellent job. Thank job. You. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. Well, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, let's see here. Uh, thanks for attending this session of Talk Tech with Turtle. Our next presentation will be on September 30th. Remember, you can view past Talk Tech with Turtles and other presentations presented by our other turtle specialists by going to YouTube and searching Talk Tech with Turtle. Thanks again for your time and hope to see you at the next Talk Tech with Turtle. Thanks, guys. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.